Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to The Regan Show, episode 81. I am your host, Dave Hartman, coming at you from Des Moines, Iowa. My guest this week is HM defense shooter Arlie Branham. This episode is brought to you by MGM Targets. Have you ever been in a match and thought, wow, I really need to practice on those skinny knockdowns, or long range practice sure would be easier if I had a couple of steel targets with hit indicators? Well, you can get the same quality steel targets that you see in major matches at MGM Targets. My favorite target lately has been the standard shape auto poppers. Those little things are challenging for pistol, shotgun, or rifle, and because they automatically reset, you can run more drills and drills with positional work without breaking to reset. Step up your practice or outfit your range and use the code DHMGM10 to save 10% on your purchase. MGM Targets has been putting up some great prizes to give away to you over the last few months. Uh, I have a June winner for the 10-inch Sportsman's Target, which I will tell you right after the uh, the episode here. And uh, the July giveaway is going to be for an MGM Switch View lever. For details and to enter, go to 3gunshow.com slash MGM. Uh, this past year, in October 2015, I traveled to Tulsa, Oklahoma to check out the 3 Gun Nation Pro Match and the Nationals. While I was out there, I met a bunch of cool people. And, uh, and today I share with you an interview with one of those cool people. In this episode, Arlie Branham and I discuss finding the right local match to fit your goals, getting serious about practice, and how to diagnose and address your weaknesses. Links from this show can be found at 3gunshow.com slash episode 81, or you can just tap the album art on your smartphone and it will take you right there. Now please join me in welcoming to the show, Arlie Branham. Arlie, welcome to the 3Gun Show. Hi Dave, how are you? I'm doing excellent, man. Uh, my belly's full. I'm happy. We just had a, a wonderful meal, wonderful meal in your home here, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk some three gun. Although we've been talking about three gun for three hours here, so hopefully we still have something left for the uh, the recording. Yes, yes, we have. Um, I don't have a whole lot of a life. I pretty much work and shoot. So if you don't want to talk about my job, which is pretty boring, then we have to talk about three gun. Well, I know that you you are an engineer because uh, you know you and I met at uh, nationals last year, three gun nation nationals, and uh, we chatted up, uh, we chatted quite a bit. And so I know you're an engineer. I mm-hmm. I used to work in an engineering firm, so I definitely know that I don't want to know about your job. So let's talk some three gun. Sounds good to me. <laughs> but uh, but first, you know, for the people that don't know you, uh, give us an idea of who you are off the range. Um, off the range, first and foremost, uh, I'm a dad. I'm not a father. I'm a dad. Um, <laughs> me and my, my, my boys are very close. I also have a nine year old daughter, so she's nine. So right now we're obviously not that close because you know, she's in the girl stuff. But as far as me and my boys go, we like to hunt and fish and shoot, uh, like crazy, which oddly enough, my boys get really aggravated. Like when I try to take video of them or pictures of them to post on social media. Really? What's that? I'm not really sure, but, um, just, you know, last weekend we went camping and I took some video of both of them shooting, you know, one of my rifles and they're like, dad, don't post it on social media. Don't post it on social media. And I'm like, you know, it's kind of like the scrapbook of life. Yeah. Um, well, especially for them, you know, at their age, every little moment of their life is going to be like documented. Yeah. And they grow so fast. It's like all at once I turn around my youngest son's 13, my oldest one's 15, and he's almost looking me dead in the eyes now. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, Big and guy. He's, he's all at once, he just sprouted up. Kind of scary. Huh. A little bit. So now do they have like some sort of a, a version of social media? Do they use it themselves or? Actually, neither one of them use it very much at all. Interesting. Yeah, but. It's fairly unique. It is unique, right? So it's kind of odd because it's like, well, this is my dad, you know, he's 39 years old. He's all over social media. I'm 15 and I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Which is backwards of most of the country. My buddy Wade's son is like that. He, uh, he's 16. I think he's going to be 17 this year in September, something like that. And, uh, he's totally non social media. Um, does not even have any email address. Oh wow! Yeah, just recently got a, a cell phone to where he'll text and stuff like that, and so he's 
you know, he in, enjoys texting his dad, but no Snapchat, no Instagram, no Facebook, no email address. Well, I can tell you that they both uh, definitely text message. Yeah. Because one of them, which shall remain nameless, the youngest one, sent 8,000 text messages in 30 days. <laughs> 8,000. 8,000. I said, son, that has to be some kind of a record, and you should be able to make some type of money off of doing that. <laughs> you know, if you can send 8,000 text messages in 30 days, that's an accomplishment. I don't care who you are. So that seems like it'd be like a, a good candidate for a phone call if it takes you 8,000 text messages to get your message across. Yeah, but he hates talking on the phone. Uh, yeah, me too. If you call him, he won't answer. He'll text you, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to talk to me. That's why I called you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Artley, you're a, you're a dad, and I, I know you're an engineer. Yep. And you uh, you hunt and fish with your boys. Yep. And somewhere in there, you find time to shoot three gun as well. Yes, I do. Um, I, honestly, you know, I grew up with a dad that was a, a we'll we'll say a part time gunsmith, mm -hmm. um, and all of my life, there's been hunting and fishing in the outdoors. It's like everywhere I turned, you know, I was either going hunting with grandpa or hunting with my dad, or we were going fishing. And then as I got a little bit older, um, it kind of branched out into other things. Like, you know, my dad had a uh, Branham gun repair for a while, and he was way back in the day when the SKSs was like a hot item. He was buying them by the truckloads. And we would, you know, drive and pick them all up and then take them to the gun show and he would sell them because he was an FFL. But on kind of the downside was my dad's thing was precision. So he liked the super accurate rifles. Mm -hmm. He could care less about shooting fast. Oh, It yeah. was all about accuracy. Um, we also shot quite a bit of skeet, you know, which was a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed that. But I remember... I don't know. I was probably 13 or 14 at the time. And to me, like a semi-automatic pistol was like the Mecca. Yeah. It was everything. Right. And my dad says, you know, you don't need that semi-automatic stuff. It's junk. Well, I saved up some money. So we go to the gun show and I buy, you know, my dad, I gave him the money and, and he bought it for me, but it was, uh, I think it was called a Tokarev. And it was a nine millimeter. Yeah, some weird nine millimeter. Nine yeah. millimeter curves or something like that. It, but or is it nine millimeter Toker? I, I don't it know. Was an, it just... was a Tokarev pistol. I remember. I, and I also remember I bought two boxes of ammo with the gun. Mm -hmm. And once those two boxes of ammo was shot, which was probably an hour after we got back right. to the house, the gun just kind of vanished, just disappeared. And then a couple of days later, my dad was like, "Well, here's your money back on that gun." He absolutely did not like the semi-automatic no pistol. No kidding. No, did not. Now, he had several revolvers that uh -huh. he liked, um, and it was just, that's just kind of how it was. So, when I turned 21, the day I turned 21, I actually went to a gun shop, and I had been reading these magazines, you know, guns and ammo, this and that and the other, and it was like... The forty caliber Glock. <laughs> the Glock 21 is the pistol of 22. all pistols. Yeah, the Glock 22, my bad. Yeah. So, I walk in there. I flip my ID out. I have the cash. The guy's like, uh, we can't sell this to you. What if you were born at midnight tonight? What? Yeah. Would not sell it to me. <laughs> what is He's like, you need to come back tomorrow. And I said, I'm going to buy this gun, but I guarantee you I'm not buying it here. Yeah. So I left there, and I was pretty disgusted. Um, what a weird thing to say. Like, yeah. It's, it, uh, yeah. It, that has nothing to do with anything in any sort of realm, legally, whatever. It's, it's the date. They never ask what hour you were born. Yep. In Ohio, you have to be 21. Right. You know, and I was 21 on that day. So the next morning I got up and... Went directly to the closest place, paid about $35 more, which was money I didn't have at the time, but I bought my very first Glock 22. Nice. And I still have it to this day. Nice. Um, fr I mean, it was just basically a love affair with Glocks from that point on. Yeah? Yeah. And I'm 39 now. Um, so it's been quite a love affair. <laughs> so then uh, 
So you got your first clock, mm -hmm. and I imagine you picked up a box of ammo and went straight out and, and shot it. Yes. When did it turn to like practical shooting? When did you first discover practical shooting? When did you get involved in it? All right. Well, there's a place that's sort of local to where I live. It's in uh, Dayton, Ohio. It's called Sim Trainer. And what they do is what they call practical slash tactical shooting. Mm -hmm. So you go there like every Tuesday night, it's 50 round maximum and they set up different scenarios. So sometimes they'll, they'll actually have a car. It's an indoor range. They'll actually have a car and you'll get to shoot, you know, through the car, around the car, whatever. So I went to that and I shot that for maybe I'll say six matches roughly give or take. And, um, the, one of the ROs at the place kind of looked at me and said, you know, you're, you're taking this too seriously. You're going too fast. You need to slow down because you're not being safe. And I looked at him and I said, you know, did I break the 180? No. Did I muzzle myself or anyone else? No. I said, then what's the problem? So on the, on the way home, I kind of decided, you know, that wasn't for me anymore. On the same hand though, what they do is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was more into the competitive side and I wanted to be more competitive. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is trying to prepare you for a situation to where if you have to draw your carry gun, you kind of have been there before. Right. Right. So right. what they're doing is a good thing and I'm not knocking, you know, knocking it by any means, but if you're competitive, that might not be the place for you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's different flavors of, of everything and that's the, uh, the great thing about, I guess shooting in general is if you don't like one thing, you can always go find something else. And there's just a, you know, a couple minor tweaks makes it, makes it fun, you know? Correct. Correct. So, you know, I pretty much set it home for a while, <laughs> went out, did some, what I, what I'll call training for the time. Um, you know, the best stuff I could find on YouTube, this and that yeah. and the other. Watching Magpul videos. Yeah. Magpul videos. <laughs> oh man, they were awesome. You know, you got the, the classics there. So, and I'm sitting at home, and it's like a Friday evening, and I think it might have been on the Sportsman's Channel. I'm kind of channel surfing, and it comes up, and it's like Three Gun Nation. You know, there's a match near you, and I was like, well, this is like a double whammy because, one, I can shoot, you know, more competitive, and, two, it's going to justify the guns that I want or need <laughs> or have or somehow this is going to help me. Or you want to need. Yeah, stuff that I want to need. So uh, I get online real quick, and you know I find that there's actually a, a match that's somewhat local to me. And when I do that, I just fire off an email. I said, hey, you know, I've shot this, I've done that. Because I also used to shoot competitive archery as well. So the guy emails me back probably within 10 minutes. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, I, I don't really know the equipment that I need, but kind of here's what I have. You know, I have a Bushmaster AR-15, I have an 870 pump shotgun, and I have a Glock 17 and a Glock 22. So he says, you know, bring your, your 9mm pistol, bring your shotgun, bring your AR-15, mag pouches if you have them. Someone else there will loan you what you need to get you through the match. So I show up to the match, and I'm nervous. You know, I get there, like when I was shooting, you know, the tactical stuff, there might be 15 people there, roughly, and a lot of them was older gentlemen, you know, so I show up at my first three gun match, and there's some young guys there, and there's like 35, 40 people, and I'm like, uh, this is a little intimidating, <laughs> you know, and there's not just one little course of fire, there's like six courses of fire, and so... Um, I want to say against my better judgment because I've always kind of been a bit of a recluse, if you will. So I just, you know, I roll up there, I get my stuff out like I own the place and I'm trying to, you know, put on my big boy pants and pretend like I know what I got going on when really I don't. And uh, I, I shot the match and there was one of the guys that was there. I, I seen, you know, they were, when they loaded their shotguns, they were loading two rounds at a time off of this chest rig. And I, I look at that, and the first thing I think was, man, that would be really slick for deer hunting because I could load <laughs> slugs like nobody's business, you know. And uh, <laughs> that was the first thought, you know. 
I, we're only allowed to have three in our gun, but at that rate, I mean, I could yeah, carry like good. a whole, you know, like 20 rounds of slugs. So the guy, you know, me and the guy start talking and uh, he let me borrow his chest rig. And the first time that I ever actually loaded deuces into my totally bone stock Remington 870, I removed my left thumbnail. Oh, you wanted it too hard, huh? Going a little too fast? Uh, I wanted something like a medic <laughs> right after that because that was terrible. So, you know, I got that done, and uh, it was another love affair all over. So my very first three-gun match, even though I ripped my thumbnail off, um, and there was a lot of people there that had been shooting for a while, I, I still fared pretty well, you know. I, and I thought, I, if I put forth the effort, I can be competitive at this, you know, in some capacity. So I came home and um, prayed that she wouldn't find the credit card bill for a while and got online and did some shopping and then tried to beat her home from work <laughs> for the next couple weeks to uh, get all my stuff and get it packed away in the basement, you know, before she knew I spent $2,000 on miscellaneous stuff that I didn't really need, but I needed it. Well, then it looks like you had it forever. Well, it's been right. in the basement. Well, it's been in the basement. I don't know why the charge is just not coming through. I mean, it'll be it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, so that that was my, my first three-gun match. And after that, I don't know, for a long time, I was just kind of, you know, I didn't realize how big three-gun actually was. Mm -hmm. You know, so I shot the local club match once a month, and, and it was like the night before the match. And, and they always shoot on Sundays over there at Clinton County. And uh, I might have got three hours of sleep yeah. before the matches because I just couldn't wait, you know. I would be in the basement with all my gear on like a little <laughs> dork, you know, <laughs> looking at myself and dry firing and doing this and that and the other. But it, I was just completely hooked. I was, I couldn't shake it, if you will. I loved it from the very first time. Hmm. That's pretty cool. So you guys have a like a three gun nation match locally then? Yes, we do. It's um Clinton County Farmers and Sportsmen's Association. Okay. And so when when I started three gun, um, I started shooting at like my local club that is like a oh, like a private club. Mm -hmm. So there'd be like a squad of dudes. There'd be like six or seven dudes that shot three gun, right? And then you would be on one bay, you tear down the first stage and then re you know put everything up back up for the second stage you know and if the uh if the match director was doing his job you use the same stuff and you just kind of move it around right mm -hmm. so when uh when i went to like a my first three gun match that is also like a local club match but at a different range where they had five bays oh wow and, you know and yeah and it was all set up and we just went from bay to bay to bay mm -hmm. and then there was like 50 dudes there or 60 dudes it was the same feeling that you're describing it was like this is a big deal. I, I, you know, I'm nervous. Yeah. And uh, I used, I would call them like, well, these are big matches. Well, we're going to the, we're going to go shoot the local match. Or we're going to shoot the big match. You know? mm -hmm. And I remember being like kind of intimidated by going to shoot with those guys. Cause there was a lot of guys there that were really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of guys there that weren't, but, <clears throat> but it was the same thing for me. It was, I, I got, you know, hooked on it. And for the long, for the longest time, all I did was shoot, Local matches. Yeah, you know, I did too. Yeah. So when did when did you finally venture out, learn about major matches, and when did you shoot your first major match? All right. So uh, everyone knows who Mo Shaw is. I've heard of him. M yeah, right. Mo Shaw <laughs> is uh, one of my best friends, and he's my hauling partner. You know, we, we travel to matches together, split the expenses, yada, yada. So it's good to have a friend like that. Yeah, it really is. Um, and also, you know, he helps me, I help him, you know, we critique each other, hey, you're doing this or you're doing that, you shouldn't be, yada, yada. So, Mo starts talking about Three Gun Nation, and they're going to have a regional championship match in South Carolina, you know, and up here in Ohio, it gets pretty cold, mm -hmm. you know, so come about November, unless you want to try to load a shotgun with numb fingers and everything else that goes along with that, uh... I pretty much kind of stopped shooting because it was so cold. And that year was a really horrible winter for us. So I want to say it was roughly February, um, maybe 2013-ish. Mo says there's a regional, three-gun nation regional championship match in Clinton, South Carolina. And I said, 
okay, what's that mean? And Mo said, well, there's going to be like, you know, 200 competitors there. So this is going to really let us know where we stand. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do it. You know, I'm game. So I think four of us total, you know, loaded up in Mo's minivan and, and away we go. We're off. Um, and we head down there and boy, I had no idea what was in store for me <laughs> because when you shoot the club matches, you know, you have a couple bays and then you might shoot out to a hundred yards or maybe 200 yards on a, you know, a full size target at 200 yards. But when you go to your first regional match and you're shooting at, what is it? Eight inch mm-hmm. swingers at 300. Mm-hmm. That was eye opening. Yeah. To say the different. least. It's like your XM 193 doesn't do. No, quite as as adequate a job. No, it didn't. It 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 didn't, and I didn't have match grade ammo. Yeah, didn't understand the value of match grade ammo. Yeah, I'm like, well, I can shoot a pop can at 100 yards, so I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, you it's know, perfect. It, yeah, it was naive, and you know, a whole host of other things of just not knowing what exactly you think you know. So we go to that match, and when we get there, the first thing, like right off the gate, is I'm starstruck. Because the people that I've been watching on TV, that I've seen on TV, are there. Yeah. You know, and they're just walking around and they're talking. And I'm like, wow, these are like normal humans, you know. They're joking with each other. They're socking each other in the arm. Yep. They're just doing normal normal dude things. Normal dude stuff, but I'm totally starstruck. So, you know, we go, we register, we do what we need to do. We kind of walk some stages a little bit because it's our first match and we don't really understand what's going on or at least I didn't I won't speak for everyone else so we show up the next morning to start shooting and we get there and I'm like I'm looking at the stage and everything and uh, I look over and the man himself Jerry is there and and there's his wife and there's Lena and I'm like Jerry Michalak Jerry Michalak and I'm like I shoot a Jerry Michalak shotgun (laughs) And there he is right there. You know, can I get Jerry to sign this? I am totally starstruck. And he comes walking over and he talks to me a little bit. He's a super, super nice person, yeah. you know. And I look at him and I'm like, Jerry, you know, this is the first big match I've ever shot. I said, uh, you know, what kind of advice would you give a guy that's never shot a big match? And he looks at me dead serious. Like, you know, the heavens have opened. The angels are speaking. Puts his hand on my shoulder, looks me dead in the eyes and says, Shoot fast and don't miss. And he walks away. And I'm standing there like, I have the key to the heavens. Jerry Michalak just told me. And as it, you know, for a few seconds, I sat there and I'm, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the key. Yeah, that's definitely the key, Jerry. Thanks. You know, you just you, you just helped me out a ton. I think you're leaving some parts out. <laughs> you're, you're leaving out a whole lot of stuff there, Jerry. Um, but you know, it was, it was awesome. And, you know, I think Jerry sh- shot the stage and I don't know, maybe 30 seconds and I shot it in like eight minutes. <laughs> so it, it was good to go from there on out. But that was my first major. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. There was one distant stage, uh, that I remember. And I remember there was a three gun nation barricade and, you know, you had to go prone, under the the bottom port in the barricade and I remember at one point in time I'm like there's six targets and I only have 30 rounds in this mag at some point in time I need to move just so I can at least not get a failure to engage right because I was missing that much um but there you know there was some a lot of positives that came out of that match like one thing I learned I had no idea what I was doing and two was I met Mike Sexton oh yeah that was my first time I met Mike Sexton (laughs) Mike Sexton's a cool dude. Yeah, he was the RO on what, uh, there was a stage on the dam, and I remember that. The R, He was the RO there. He looked at me, and he said, boy, why do you look so nervous? He's like, you're so nervous, your cheeks are shaking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I've never shot a major match before, sir, you know, and I really don't know what to do. He's like, well, you turn the safety off, and you pull the trigger. That was, that was. God, un- that sounds just like Mike. Yeah, and he was just laughing, you know. But that's Mike, and now, you know, Mike, I consider Mike a friend. I enjoy shooting with him. I enjoy being around him. And and now that I know Mike and I know his personality, Mike was really just screwing with me. Yeah. That's all he was doing because that's all Mike does. (laughs) (laughs) He sure does, doesn't he? Yeah, he's definitely good at that. Yeah, I got the opportunity to uh, 
uh, hang out with Mike quite a bit when we were at the uh, the two A Heritage three gun camp. Yeah, and uh, man, you should hear him talk to uh, the kids. It's just like he's talking to you. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's like he treats everyone exactly the same, and uh, he's he he told them the same thing. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our guns, we're gonna load them up, and we're gonna shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah I mean, very that, simple. That, that's all there is to it, and and I was you know. If you've been to Clinton House and you and you've shot, you know where the dam is at. At a certain time, certain times of the day, when the sun's setting over the hill, um, and if there's a plate rack that you're trying to shoot, you know under the buzzer during competition, when the sun's setting, you can't really see the plate rack if it's back in the, you know, back in the shade a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then when you do actually get to hit one, there's this nice cloud of smoke, right. and, and you're sitting there going, "Oh man, where's the rest of them go? What am I gonna do?" And the whole time Mike's behind you with the timer going, pull the trigger, boy, pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is awesome. This is great. I can't wait to come back. Pretty much. So then there must have been uh, there must have been something about that, <clears throat> um, that regional that made you want to get better, do more matches, go to go experience more matches because I've I've seen you at, at quite a few of them. Yeah, I'm I'm here and there from time to time now. <laughs> so when uh, so when did it it go from like okay, well I'm just gonna go shoot this match, but I'm nervous as hell to like all right now I'm committing, I'm gonna shoot this ma- many major matches and I'm gonna set up like a you know practice regimen to make sure that uh, that uh, I'm not scared that I know that I'm well prepared for it. Well, there was a couple things. One was you know when you spend your life. Um, loving firearms and loving the outdoors and there's not a lot of people I will say you know that you meet on a daily basis that loves firearms or loves the outdoors so once I started shooting three gun and the people that just the people that are at the matches they it's like a brotherhood almost so I loved the people of the matches I loved the camaraderie and I also you know kind of felt accepted you feel accepted because everyone that's there loves firearms yeah right and and in today's world i won't say that that's a common thing you know that happens and and even if it is a common thing it's like uh not many people talk about it for fear of having to maybe it's for fear of having to defend what they like you know it's like i don't want to get an argument in every day so i usually just don't bring it up you know correct so the, the pe- just the people alone, you know, and, and the willingness of everyone there to help. Because if you're at any three-gun match and your gun goes down on a stage, the next stage, there will be two, three, four, or ten people standing there going, here's my gun. It runs best on this ammo. You can use my ammo. Here's my mags. You can use my equipment, you know. Even though you're competing against them, they will let you use all of their gear. They will tell you their dope on their scope. This is what you need to, you know, to hit that target. Use this to hit that target. So that is, you know, what other group of people are you going to find that's that, that that's like that, that's that friendly? You've never met him before in their life, but he's going to give you a $2,000 rifle yeah. and $40 worth of ammo just to burn up so you can finish well. Yeah. You know, it, it should be a Visa commercial. <laughs> it's priceless. It is priceless. It's pretty incredible in uh, – um I don't know. It's it. It's just a. Uh, it makes you feel like energized to be around all those people with one common goal, and then uh, to have them ha- be, you know, a, no pun intended, but of a higher caliber than than your just average everyday person. It's really cool to yeah to be able to, you know, yeah. What am I trying to say? It's really cool to be able to be associated with with those yeah, people. Yeah, to be a makes part of the come, family. Exactly, and it makes you want to come back more. Yeah, it there does. I mean, it really does. And, you know, I, I like to finish well. I like to feel like, you know, I'm at least progressing. But what keeps me coming back is the people. Mm-hmm. It's the camaraderie. It's the friendship, you know. People live all across the country, and I only see them at major matches. And I go to shoot a major match, and they're there, and it's like I was hanging out with them for the last five days. You know, we're friends. We sat down. You know, we talk. We do mm-hmm. whatever. So the just the people and the camaraderie is a big thing for me, but I mean that's not all true. I also do like to do well, so <laughs> um, you know I did set up a pretty decent practice regimen. I think um, 
you know, to try to better myself. And I don't necessarily want to finish first or, you know, in the top 10 or this or that or the other, because I compete more with myself. It's, you know, did I finish better in this match than I did in the last match? Am I making progress? Am I moving forward or am I staying stagnant or am I moving backwards? So as long as I see progress, I think I'm okay. Um, you know, granted, I would like to, you know, win a regional or something like that. But sure. on the same hand, is it, you know, something that I think is feasible? It might be feasible in the future, potentially. But am I going to beat myself up if I don't place in the top 10? No, I'm not. Because I'm there to have a good time. I'm there to um, enjoy myself. You know, it's a glorified hobby, so to speak, for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I really enjoy it. it. The only thing I enjoy more than shooting is is my children who are growing up. So uh, sooner or later they're going to go off to college or, you know, do whatever it is they're going to do. And I need something to do. <laughs> so I'm just preparing myself Nice for when they move out. That's when I'll hit the big times. <laughs> awesome. Well, and the cool thing is, uh, with this sport, there's, uh, you know, it's it's not like you have to be 22 and then you're washed up by the time you're 27. You know, right? Like you can have a long, uh, long shooting career. Yep. And uh, and still have a good time. So, what tell us? Like, give us some specifics. What does your your practice um, sessions look like? If you were to say, all right, just shot. You know, three Gun Nation Eastern Regional. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do a practice session this week. Mm-hmm. What does that practice session look like? Okay, so one of the things that I do is I I always try to get someone to video me, right? And um, when you're shooting a match, yeah, when I'm shooting a match, I try to get someone to video me. And you know, some of it is to post on social media to help promote my sponsors and so forth, but majority of it is to help myself because. You know, when I shot, for, I shot for probably a year, and although I was slightly progressing, I was not progressing as fast as I thought I should. So I started having someone video me while I was shooting, because for me, the way my mind works is if I watch my video and I see where I'm moving slow, you know, let's say, for instance, if it's target transitions. So if I shoot a match and I notice that from one target to the next that I'm slow. I will come home and I will practice the V drill. I literally have practiced so much before that I had blisters on my hands. <laughs> um, That's some of dedication that, right there. Yeah, some of it, you know, is aggressive stippling on the Glock I was shooting at the time. But even with that being said, to practice that much, you know, just to get your transitions better. And the thing about 3-Gun is... You can't just go out and practice rifle, 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 rifle. Because when as soon as you do that, your pistol will drop off. Mm-hmm. So then you'll go to the next match. You'll do really great on rifle. And your pistol is like somewhere at the bottom. And your shotgun's only mediocre now. So you have to try to keep a balance. But I've literally ran the V-drill with slugs. Like you and I was talking <laughs> about earlier. Um you can't shoot two and then two and then two and then, you know, everyone who knows the V-drill because you don't have enough capacity, but you can definitely put one. So that's a good point, Arlie. So for someone who does not know what the V-drill is, we have uh, a lot of, you know, new uh, new shooters that mm-hmm. listen to this, this show. We have yep. a lot of people that haven't even shot their first match yet. Mm-hmm. So if someone's not familiar with the V-drill, can you describe what that drill is and like how they would set it up themselves? All right. So the best way I can describe it is you're going to need five targets, yeah. right? five of your cardboard targets you put one target in the middle and then you go let's see what do i do i set it up in a very various different ways so i think on average you'll go one step out from your first target and you'll go one step back so you'll have your first target in the front and then you'll have essentially a cardboard target over the right shoulder and a cardboard target over the left shoulder of your center target. Mm -hmm. Then beyond that, you'll do the same thing. Only you'll put it over the outside shoulder of the two targets you just placed. Okay. Right. So you start in the middle. When the buzzer goes beep, you put two rounds in the first target. Then I always go to the right. So I'll put two rounds in the next target. Then you go back to the center target, two rounds. And then you go out to the far target, two rounds, back to the center target, two rounds, to the left target, two rounds, back to the center, two rounds, 
to the far left two rounds, then back to the center two rounds. And I will do various um, variations, if mm-hmm. you will, of that, and, I, and I'll move the targets further apart. Okay. Or I will back up further and further and further. So how far away are you when you're doing that? Uh, um, in, the, in the first uh, iteration you were talking about? Probably about maybe eight yards. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'll start like at eight yards, and I'll just run my pistol, just bang, 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 bang. And then, you know, I'll throw another mag in, and I'll back up three steps. So I'm at roughly 12 yards. Bang, 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 bang. And and I will do this all the way back until I'm 20, 25, 30 yards. It, ju- it just kind of depends. But you can use the V-drill to improve your accuracy. You can use the V-drill to improve your target transition. And you can also, another thing that I'll do is I actually have ran a V-drill, but the the furthest targets were roughly 30 yards apart. Oh, wow. So it was way spread out, you know. And uh, I'll do that, and I'll go all the way back to, like, 50 yards with my rifle and run the V-drill that way. And I think that uh, Rick Birdsall is actually, I seen him running a variation where he was pretty far back. So then I started doing it as well. You know, I didn't come up with it on my own. (laughs) I pretty much copy and cheat from everyone else who posts the videos because that's how I learn. Which I, you know, I think is honestly a good way of, uh, of, uh, of practicing. You know, you look at what, like, say, Keith Garcia is doing as far as his drills go, what Rick's mm-hmm. doing, you know, and a, a lot of the other guys that post them. And, uh, and you know, you, you don't necessarily want to compare yourself to him if you're <laughs> a newer shooter. Right. Because uh, those guys rock. Uh, but then, uh, but put those, you know, down and put them in a notebook and take them to the range for your, your uh, practice day. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I'll do is I'll shoot the V drill, but I'll shoot only headshots. Oh, you know I'll shoot only headshots, or I will uh, um, attempt to shoot only A zone hits. You know, only center mass hits. I'll I'll run it that way pretty often, and especially like if we're coming up on a major, then I will try to use enough discipline just to run A zone hits. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, if I go out there and I don't have all A zone hits, you know, uh, it is what it is. Because in three gun, you need two anywhere, right? But if you try to focus on just A zone hits and you're trying to shoot as fast as you can, then it's muscle memory. So once you're in a match, you know, you're not really thinking about every little instance that you're doing. Because when you're in a match, you don't want to think about the end result, right? Mm-hmm. You want to think about what you're doing right now. Yeah. So I kind of messed myself up slightly in the head by not only thinking about the end result, but also thinking about what I'm doing right now too much. Mm-hmm. So I'm focusing on the A zone. I'm focusing on the A zone. So I would shoot, and it was looked pretty smooth, but it was really slow. But all my zone, all my hits were A zones, right? That's that's no bueno. Right, it's no good. You go faster, right? Yeah, if you're hitting all A's, you know, unless you're Keith Garcia, right? Then that means you're 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 shooting too slow. So I needed to shoot faster. So it's a constant progression, you know, and the whole other aspect is controlling your mind while you're trying to get better. You know, you're trying to practice so that you get better, so that when you're in a major match. You don't mentally just turn into a midget, which I've been there, done that uh, more times than I would like to admit. But overall, you know, just try to do your best. Finish where you think that you should finish at, not where someone else thinks you should finish at. And enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Because you'll never be around a, a better group of people. And for me, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking earlier about the uh, the matches that you have coming up. Yeah. What's your What's your next major that you're going to shoot? Um, I believe the next one. Well, we're going to shoot the three man, the Armalite three man three gun. Okay. Me, Mo Shaw, and Matt Holmes are going to shoot that. Um, I also have uh, the pro am match at Rock Castle. Okay. Which is in August. I'm going to shoot that, and then. Uh, hopefully, 
you know, I get some type of an invite to shoot the the national match, three gun nation nationals at uh, VIR. Yeah, that'll be a good one too. So, Arlie, let's say just because uh, individual that we're talking the pro am here, mm-hmm. right? Uh, rather than the team match because it's a different kind of different kind of preparation for that match, right? Yep. So, save for the pro am. You've got it coming up in a couple weeks, mm-hmm. and you're starting to get in your mind, you know, travel plans, stuff you need to pack, getting all your gear um, ready to go, your new Benelli. My new Benelli. <laughs> your your HM rifle. And uh, um, you've got all that stuff in order, and you're going to go do some practice. Yep. What specifically would you put into to your practice for you? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, kind of how would that practice session look like? And and would it be a like a series of practice sessions? Or are you just going to do one before you go out? Oh, no, it'll be a series. It'll it'll probably be two weeks, you know, before, you know, we hit the road. Uh, I'll start practicing. And one thing, you know, uh, I live in Ohio, so locally about 200 yards is the furthest we can shoot, right? So one thing that uh, I'll definitely do is I will, I have a local friend that's a farmer and has some property and I can shoot out to approximately 450. Oh, okay. Right. So I will, I will go over there and I will try to shoot out to like 450 yards. And if I can go and I can shoot in different wind conditions, you know, that would be, that would be awesome. That way um, I'll know, you know, kind of where my holds are going to be and what I need to do. Because historically, one of the things that has killed me at matches was distance. Mm -hmm. And it's like, honestly, it's just because, you know, you can shoot out to 200 yards uh, around here locally. But beyond that, you know, I have to drive roughly an hour and 45 minutes Mm -hmm. to be able to shoot beyond 200 yards. And I also found a lovely little app called Streelock. Yeah, it's a good one. Streelock on my phone. And uh, if you put all the information in correctly, then you're good to go. Well, and you did step up to match ammunition. Yes, right? I did. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be sponsored by PPU Ammo uh, for this season, and they were gracious enough to supply me with match-grade ammo for my AR-15. They also supply me with pistol ammo, and we're working on some match-grade ammo for the pistol as well. But oh, currently cool. on the shelf, there is 5.56 five, ammo that's match-grade. Gotcha. So then you throw all your data into Streelock, and then you go out and uh, verify it when you're, yes. you know, at your, at your buddy's uh, farm. Yes. <clears throat> and so it, it's interesting, you know, when you were talking about like 200 yards, it's like the max you can get. I've been at, at ranges that that way as well. Um, the range I started shooting at, the max was like 300, mm-hmm. right? And so you figure like, oh, I'll just shoot a smaller target. But your bullet does different things over that extra hundred and something yards. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and you really only get the opportunity to experience that when you're out shooting it. Correct. You know, you can throw it in street lock all you want and everything, but unless you go out there and verify it and see it for yourself, yep. then, uh, the big thing that I've found with street lock is if you have the correct feet per second on your bullet and you know, the correct, ballistic coefficient it works rather well um if you just kind of arbitrarily grab a ballistic coefficient off of the internet because you're shooting a 556 five, <laughs> it doesn't work that well you know um if you grab a ballistic coefficient for a 55 grain full metal jacket am you know ball ammo and you're shooting 69 grain hollow point boat tails doesn't work out just so everyone listening knows <laughs> it does not work. So you're going to get a long range session in. Yes. What at else least are you one. Do? At possibly. Least one? Yeah, I, honestly, I would like to get at least three Okay. and I would like them to be spaced out. So say one day, you know, I have a five mile an hour wind. The next day I might have a 10 mile an hour wind. The next day there might be zero wind and the wind's going to change direction. So the more information I can put into my street lock, the better off I'm going to be. So right. when I actually get there, Hopefully the wind conditions is something that I have shot in before. Um, and then I'll be able to, you know, compute it and calculate it and go from there. But uh, beyond that, always, always, always practicing loading the shotgun. Because for me, myself, 
the one thing that I will definitely jam up on is the quad loads. Yeah. You know, if I do not practice them on a somewhat regular basis, then you will see me yard sale rounds all over the place. Um, it's funny if you're not me and it's okay <laughs> if you laugh. <laughs> so I will, I will definitely practice the quad loads. Um, I will do some dry fire pistol practice in the basement. Um, you know, I have a couple targets down there that I just kind of dry fire like it's my job. And then also the other thing that I'll do with pistol is I'll do some, say about 15 yards. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll do, you know, run the V drill at 15 yards, you know, kind of as fast as I can run it. And then I'll also go back to like 50 yards and uh, I'll try to shoot at like a one inch. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I actually shot about an inch and a half group at 50 yards last weekend with my pistol rested off of my, you know, shooting bag, which is, it's, it's hard to do if you've never done it, but after you've done it several times, mm-hmm. then, uh, it's really not that big of a deal. And are you still shooting a Glock? No, sir. What are you shooting now? I shoot a STI DVC. Okay. Um, if you can afford it, buy one. Yeah. That's all I can say. If you can afford it, buy one and get used to the safety. If you come from a Glock, get used to the safety. But the, the, you know, this season, the things that really brought my game up was one, practicing, um, two, having an ammo sponsor, and three was my pistol. You know, bringing, buying the DVC and, and bringing it into the mix, the first couple matches, I struggled. I really struggled. There was a couple times I just kind of wanted to chuck it over the berm. You know, because it, it's not that much different, but it is. Mm-hmm. When you've ran a Glock 34. Oh, angle's different on the uh, grip, right? I don't know. No? I, I didn't have an issue with that. Okay. Because um, you I, actually look at the front sights, then. Yeah, I actually look at the sights. <laughs> sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. It just depends. <laughs> but most of the time I don't. I just shoot real fast and move quick. Um, so, you know, bringing my pistol game up was probably one of the biggest things that I've done this season um, as far as me personally. What can I control? I can control, you know, my dry fire practice in the basement that doesn't cost anything. So that was pretty big for me. And, you know, I've had a couple people tell me, hey, you know, you're, you're finally getting along with that DVC. People that was at the first couple matches that I was, you know, attempting to shoot it at. And uh, I got a funny story, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. funny stories. Uh, here you go. <laughs> so I got my DVC and uh, I take it out to the range and I shoot. It's indoor, you know, and uh, I shoot probably 150 rounds. And I get back home. And I wanted to go to the range again, but I think my son had football practice or something. I just couldn't go that night. So I'm like, well, I'll just go in the basement and uh, I'll do some dry fire practice from holster. You know, so I have my timer out and you know, it's beep and I'm drawing, firing, drawing, firing. And uh, my youngest son comes down. He's talking to me a little bit and it was like beep. And I kind of flinched a little bit. And I was like, well, that's weird, you know, because I've been doing it for about an hour, roughly. Mm-hmm. He turns around and walks off and I reach over and I and I grab a drink. Right. My hands got a little bit sweaty from the drink. And uh, I'm standing there and it's like hit the timer. Beep, I reach down, you know, like grease lightning. I grab the DVC. I just jerk it out of the holster like nobody's business and watch it go flying across the basement. (laughs) This gun has 150 rounds through it, and I just bounced it off the concrete floor, off the wall, off the workbench, you know, and it's over in the corner spinning around in circles. (laughs) And this is not an an inexpensive gun, too. Uh, No. No, it's definitely not. I think it costs more than my first three vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I kind of stood there for a minute, and uh, my son came back down the stairs, and he looks at me, and I look at him, and I said, will you do me a favor? He's like, what's that? I said, will you go over there and pick that gun up off the floor for me and tell me just how bad the damage is? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, oh, my God, what would you do? But, yeah. It was kind of funny, but kind of not. You know? It's like getting that, that uh, first scratch in your nice new truck, though. Yep. So now you don't have to worry about dumping it into a pistol barrel no, or a just, pistol bucket at, like, full bore, you know? No. Drop it like a tot. Yep. Moveon.org. <laughs> it's 
what because that, it's already scratched up. It's already it's scratched up. Concrete yeah. in your basement. Yeah, it'll be fine now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably never drop it again in life, and it'll never get another scratch on it like it got the first week that I owned it. Mm. So the uh, so upping your pistol game was huge for you this year. Yes, it was. And you're going to be getting used to a, a new shotgun coming up here. You yes. Just picked up Benelli M2. Yes, sir. What uh, what else do you see as as areas of improvement for yourself? Um, well, let's see, since I've bought the DVC and, uh, I now have the Benelli M2 and I have, you know, one of the best rifles in my opinion in the game. Um, from here on out, it's all, it's it? all on me. It's a HM defense. Oh, okay. HM defense is my rifle sponsor. Um, but from here on out, all of the suckage that you see is on me. It's not on my equipment. Right. Yeah. You can't blame it on the equipment yeah. now. So from here on out, if something goes bad, it's my fault. So maybe I should go back to a Glock. <laughs> so you're going to be working on the soft goods then. More practice. Yeah, more more practice. Um, you know, and the the Benelli. Uh, I've been running the Versamax. I've run it for just over a year, and the gun has ran. I cannot say anything bad about the gun itself. It's just my personal preference, and that gun we do not get along. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before the Versamax, I shot the Mossberg JM Pro 930. Me and that gun got along very well. Very, very well. I could shoot that gun proficiently, you know, in my opinion. When I went to the Versamax, my shotgun game actually slightly dropped. Um, I can't really put my finger on it. I'll just say it's not the gun. It's me. It's personal preference. I'm a big boy. I can own it. So I picked up a Benelli, and I was like... Oh, it's another love affair. <laughs> Here we go. Got to have it. So I'm off to the races with it. All the goodies came in last week, you know, to get it ready to go. The the uh, extended tube and stuff. And I'm going to get my Dremel tool out and open it up nice and wide so I can, like, throw shells in there from across the yard somewhere. <laughs> and away we'll go. So... Arlie, when we're talking about working on the uh, on the soft goods after you you know mangle your uh, benelium too, mm-hmm. um, what area do you think you need to work on the most? Um, honestly, one thing that I still have issues with from time to time is the mental game. Mm-hmm. And anything specific? Uh, yeah, my brain, <laughs> <laughs> my mind. And there was a couple things that's happened that just kind of dawned on me all of a sudden. So if I'm at a local club match, you know, and I'm shucking and jiving with my buddies and life is good. And then all of a sudden they're like, Arlie, you're up. Oh, oh, I am. Okay. I'll I'll run and grab my gear and run up there and I'll shoot and I'll do great. Mm -hmm. But if I stand around, I look at the stage, I'll talk myself into like three or four or maybe 12 different stage plans and won't really settle on one. And then as I'm shooting, I'm thinking, is this the right stage plan? Should I be doing this or should I have done the other stage plan? And the whole time there's like pew, 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 pew going on. So (laughs) before the pews start, you kind of need to have everything locked down. So, you know, over the winter, um, I've went through, I don't like to read. I hate to read, but, on the same hand, they have this little thing called Audible. Yeah, I so love Audible. even if you hate to read, that's not an excuse because yeah. it will read to you while you're in the truck driving down the road. So I, I've probably listened to four Audible books um, on you know how to calm yourself, and and that that has been pretty big for me. There's quite a bit of it that I'm still trying to digest and quote unquote control because historically you know I go to a match and I'm shooting good on the first three stages on stage four I have a you know a a couple minor malfunctions or brain farts or whatever you want to call them whatever happens and then on stage five I just tank yeah just tank I'm like oh I might as well just go home it's not even worth it well that's in your mind yeah for sure you you can have a five or maybe even a ten second issue on one stage and still fair okay at the end of the match if you stay in the game. 
Keep your mind in the game. So keeping your mind in the game, staying focused on what you're doing, focus on the process that you're performing, not the outcome. And that those that's not my words. That's uh, I believe that's from the inner game of tennis. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's I think al- that's I think also a Lanny Basham uh, quote too. So that must be like a a regular sports psychology it type is. of mantra. Because I believe somewhere in uh, the Brian Enos book, I believe there's some similar phraseology. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere in there, you know, and what is that practical? fundamentals of shooting yeah on practical shooting or something like that yeah i've also been through that one um that's like seven hours when you do that on audible oh yeah yeah so if you're like me and you have a desk job then you can kind of works out pretty well yeah you can kind of man that a little bit yeah I, I got to listen to uh lanny basham's book on the way back from uh three nation nationals last year and uh we listened to the entire book it was great Oh really? Yeah. Was it uh, with winning in mind? Yeah, I have I have not been able to find that on Audible. Yeah, this was on like Apple Books or something like that. Oh, you're an Apple guy. No, it wasn't me. It was uh, my my hall and partner, Terrence. Terrence. Ter- Terrence Jackson. He had had that, and we listened to that the whole way back. Yeah, I will have to uh, steal one of my son's iPads. So I can get that because I really want that book yeah. on Audible. It's it's a good one, dude. I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, I will definitely have to look into that. But um, the inner game of tennis was, I will say, I've listened to that three, if not four times. And uh, there's a couple parts that I've probably listened to more than the rest. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's for each individual person. So the parts that I listen to several times may or may not resonate with you or what you're right. currently going through. So, <clears throat> but yeah, that was, that was a good one for me. And, and, you know, I'm kind of a dork, you know, <laughs> engineer dork kind of right, computer. Right. So the other thing that I did was I would take sticky notes and I would write little notes down, you know, throughout the day as I'm listening to it when I'm supposed to be working. And, um, <laughs> Hey, it's the three gun show. It's not like my boss is going to listen to it. He doesn't like guns. There you go. So perfect. <laughs> right. So I would take, you know, sticky notes and this and that and the other. And, uh, I actually have an app on my phone. I would put some notes in there and, and, uh, this year when I, we shot at, uh, Frank Garcia's place, universal shooting Academy in Florida, that, you know, was my best finish at a, at a major, what I'll call a major a regional match. So, and I had some issues. I had what appeared to be equipment issues on the video when actually it was kind of sort of my fault in a roundabout way because tight bolts don't come loose. So, and <laughs> they wasn't exactly tight. So, um, but I was pretty happy. I think I finished 44th in that match. And when it was said and done, I was pretty happy. And the, why was I happy with 44th? Here's why. Because I had issues on like three stages, but I never fell apart mentally. Nice. I didn't fall apart. You know, I just kind of worked through it and went on. Um, I didn't, one of the things I've done historically is if I have a minor issue, then I try to shoot super fast. Oh, yeah. Afterwards. Try to, you got to make up time, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so you're like, man, I burnt that down. It was like 67 seconds and everybody else is like 80 and they're like, yeah, but you have like 90 seconds in penalties because you didn't hit anything. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, shucksy darn. But it looked good on video. It looked good on video. I've it been there. It looked good on video because I was shooting so fast. So that didn't happen. So that was like a hurdle to get over. You know, and if you want to really shoot at the top of three gun and you want to compete with, you know, the best of the best, um, your mental game has to be absolutely on point. And I would argue that your mental game is more important than basically anything else because the slightest little thing can happen. And if you fall apart mentally, you're done. Because when you're at the top, you know, with Keith and Nick Atkinson and all those, you know, that caliber of shooter, Mm -hmm. they don't have mental brain farts. Right. They don't. So I do. 
I just try to recover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's good advice and something that you know I I don't think that you can uh, you can work um, enough when you're like say you know beginner to expert level. I mean, it, it's something you can constantly work on and constantly improve. Is just your you know your mental composure, your your stage planning and and stuff like that, and keeping yourself in the uh, in the game. Stage planning? Nobody's talking about stage planning, Dave. We're talking about the mental game right now. Well, you were talking about doing twelve different stage plans in one in one stage, you which I will say I've done. I so w- when you were saying that, um, I was having like a cathartic moment. It, I have looked at a target through my pistol sights and hesitated, thinking, "Was I going to shoot that with shotgun?" <laughs> And, and then the next thought is like, shoot, just shoot, <laughs> Jesus. Just send the pews downrange. Exactly. As long as it's not a clay or something like that, just keep shooting. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've experienced that one myself. And that that's definitely like a, uh, a mental breakdown where you – and and I look back on it on video, and you can hardly tell that I paused much. Maybe I was like trying to make a, uh, a better long shot or something like that. But I distinctly remember looking at that and taking a minute to – for my brain to think, like, was I supposed to shoot this with pistol or was I going to shoot this with shotgun? So it definitely want to try to minimize those types of uh, breaks in the action, so to speak. Yeah. So the stage planning, right? Let's talk about stage planning. Let's talk about minute. stage planning. Um, stage planning. I look at a stage and I go, you know, what's my strongest? What's my weakest? So if, if I can shoot an entire stage with pistol, is that going to be my strongest? Or if I throw a couple slugs in the gun, uh, is that going to make me faster? So at the match we just shot, um, where was we at? Clinton House, South Carolina. And Garrett Howell was in my squad. And so I get up, and right when I'm getting ready to shoot, you know, I think I've got my good stage plan. I'm like, you know, I'm going to do okay, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, Right as I'm like stepping into the box, I can hear Garrett Howell behind me going, I'm going to throw two slugs in here. I'm oh, gonna shoot no. Slug, slug, bird, slug, slug, bird, and then slug, <laughs> slug, and then I'm going to dump that, and I'm going to finish out with my pistol. So right as I'm getting ready to start shooting, I'm like, I screwed up my stage plan. Oh, really? Because Garrett Howell like, <laughs> can break down a stage yeah. like nobody's business. I, I got to shoot on uh, Garrett's squad this uh, last week in a war sport. He's a cool dude. He He's a good human. He's a good human. He's a good human. And he's a, a good shooter. Yeah, and you can say, Garrett, how should I shoot this stage? And he'll go, well, here's what I'm going to do. And he'll tell you mm-hmm. exactly what he's going to do. I'm going to take three steps. I'm going to turn right. I'm going to shoot this. Then I'm going to turn left. I'm going to shoot that. I'm going to reload two. I'm going to do this. And, you know, that's the people of Three Gun, though. Mm-hmm. They will tell you oh, exactly yeah. what they think is going to be best. And and so I'm, like, shooting the stage and the whole time I'm thinking I should be shooting slugs right now because Garrett Howe's shooting slugs, but I'm not shooting slugs. No, I'm sending pews <laughs> downrange with the pistol. And then he beats me by like, I don't know, 10 or 12 seconds. Right. And I'm like, well, okay, it is what it is. But on the same hand, um, I was not nearly as comfortable then being two weeks ago mm-hmm. with the slug performance. Ah, uh, yeah, because you're shooting your first max. Um. Not to be mentioned, but yeah. And it <laughs> likes to shoot slugs anywhere from 12 to 18 inches to the right, so you have to make yourself hold off target. Right, Kentucky windage. Yeah, which is very hard for me to do. Some people can do it. I was talking to uh, Matt Kapika at the three-man, three-gun match, and he said, you know, I have two or three Versamaxes. He said they all shoot slugs like a rifle. And I said, well, that's a gun you should keep mm-hmm. because mine does not. Um. I don't know if it's unique to my gun. I'm not beating. I'm a Remington to the soul kind of guy when it comes to shotguns. I've got like five of them. But on the same hand, we just don't jive. But my Benelli, on the other hand, I shot 10 slugs out of it last week. It shoots slightly high at 50 yards, which is exactly what I want. Right. And they're dead nuts on center. Nice. Yeah. So going forward, I need to stock up on some slugs. There you go. And then you can use Garrett's uh, stage plan. Yeah, I wonder if we could go back and reshoot that stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then to pile on what a uh, – I feel like i got to mention this. Uh, pile on what a cool guy uh, uh, Garrett is. So I, I don't think I had met him until 
until this weekend of war sport. I meet a lot of white guys with beards, mm-hmm. but, um, he, uh, was at the, uh, side in range when, uh, when we went up there to go side in and, uh, I'm, you know, getting my stuff together and, you know, kind of eyeballing like, okay, what do I have to work with here and stuff? And I'm, he sees this and he's like, uh, Oh Dave, use this stool. You know, you're going to want to, you're going to want to use this. Well, he didn't say Dave, but he's like, here, use the stool. And I'm like, okay, thanks. And then, uh, I'm sitting there on my mag and he's like, no, you're, you're going to want to put that on a bag too. Go ahead and put it on the bag. I'm like, Oh, okay, thanks. And, and I'm looking at the targets and he's like, well, that one's 300 and that one's 400 and that one's 500 and five. I'm like, Oh, okay, thanks. And then, uh, I'm kind of, you know, take a couple shots and then I look up and he's like, well, why don't you let me spot that for you? And then he comes over and stands next to me. <laughs> I was like, Geez, this guy's great. He must work yeah. the range here. <laughs> nope, doesn't work there. <laughs> no, but he was a uh, he was a total cool dude and helped uh, help me out with uh, you know <clears throat> my uh, rifle zero and everything, and you know very knowledgeable on on uh, more knowledgeable than me on my reticle, which was uh, kind of embarrassing. But um, and then uh, he ended up being on my squad, and right before we're going to go shoot some uh, long range on stage five. He's like, uh, all right, Dave, that's 308 out there, so remember, hold here. I'm like, how do you remember my holds? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, it, 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 <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing, but, you know, it is what it is. So one of the stages uh, at the last regional match, uh, you know, I'm standing there and I'm looking and looking and looking and walking around and, like, trying to take mental notes and, well, I need to stand here and do this and I need to stand here and do that. And, and Garrett comes walking up and he looks over. I'm going to go over here, I'm going to shoot this, I'm going to dump that, I'm going to run over here, I'm going to shoot that, I'm going to do this, bam. And he just walks off. Probably 30 seconds. Jeez. Yeah. I, I personally do not have that ability. Yeah. You know, to look at a stage and break it down that fast. Hopefully someday I get there, you know. Um, right now I don't, so that's another goal. It's another milestone in 3-Gun. Yeah. Know, to get better is the stage breakdown and how do you go about doing it. I'll tell you... Someone else that, you know, I don't know personally, but I've shot around and been around is Nick, Nick Atkinson. Mm-hmm. Uh, I watched him doing that at the Florida Regional, you know, on one stage, and I actually followed his plan. I kind of just kind of eavesdropped on him and <laughs> followed around behind him, and, oh, that's what Nick's doing. That's what I'm going to do. And I did it, and it worked very well. Um, but, you know, everyone everyone's mind works differently. Yeah. Um, when it comes to doing engineering stuff, stuff comes naturally to me it just that's just how my mind works when it comes to stage breakdown it just comes naturally to garrett howe you know yeah. <laughs> so i mean that's the best way i can describe it I, I don't have any other words for it other than he's a natural well it's a good thing for us that he's a natural then and then uh we just get to be around him and, and yeah and benefit squad from with him. him and there you go well so so arlie We've covered a lot of ground tonight, yep. and I think there's some uh, some good stuff, some good good gems in here for the audience. Um, Got to work toward wrapping up, but I want to ask you a few questions mm-hmm. that I ask all my guests. All right. I'm going to modify one of them a little bit because you told me a cool story earlier that I want to hear again. <laughs> so the first one, um, I usually ask uh, about the most spectacular DQ, but I want to hear about uh, your wildest match story. My wildest match story. Well, we shot, me and Mo, we shot a three-gun regional match at Rock Castle Shooting Center. Um, it might have been early last year, the year before, I don't remember. But at that match, I was squatted with a guy named Trip Mackingvale. And Trip Mackingvale, in and of himself, is just... He, I, don't, I can't even describe him. He's larger than life, pretty much because he is. He is a huge <laughs> human. Um, but so we're, Se- second trip story on the uh, <laughs> podcast. By the way. So we're down in Thunder Valley, and it is raining like there's no tomorrow. It's pouring down rain, and uh, you know me and Mo, we was in the Danger Ranger, and there is video proof of this. So. Of me and Mo and the Ranger, not of Trip, but Trip has a. And this is a Ford Ranger, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a little pickup truck. Okay. Yeah, a little pickup truck. You know, I'm a pretty big dude. Yeah. And uh, there ain't much space in there. So anyway, <laughs> first, Trip is like, uh, you know, I'm driving up there. I'm driving up there because it was like up a hill, you know, 
and there was like kind of a muddy tractor pathish kind of thing mode and Tri- <laughs> trip jumps in his raptor and has gear in the bed of his raptor and it's raining and it's pouring down the rain and he immediately just floors it i mean he is like flying up through these weeds and there's no way that he can really see where he's going because of the rain and the weeds and there's like stuff bouncing out of the back of his truck and he gets all the way up there and he like jumps out of the truck and he's like hey you boys see any stuff on your way up here grab it and bring it up the hill (laughs) right so me and Moe's at the bottom and and we're in Moe's little tiny Ford Ranger but it's four wheel drive so I'm like okay you gonna drive up this hill he's like yep we're driving up this hill I was like roger that and I immediately grabbed my phone and turned the camera on. <laughs> so I'm like, this is going to be one of those, remember that time? And I want this on video. So we we, we start going, and uh, the, the video's out there. I think Mo's got it on YouTube, or it's on our Facebooks or something. And we got to find that, if, so I well, can put that in the show notes. If you're a junior, um, there is possibly some foul language used when he tried to eject me from the vehicle. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> we take off and I can see that there's like a miniature continental divide in front of the truck. And I start saying, go right, go right. And I mean like, go right, like turn the wheel all the way to the right. Mo just turns it slightly to the right and then accelerates profusely. And which point the Ranger falls into the great continental divide. And we now have three wheel motion. To where <laughs> so like in a big ditch, a huge ditch, <laughs> like the left rear tire wasn't even on the ground. <laughs> and he jumps out of the truck and he's like, you made me wreck my truck. I'm like, I told you to turn right. I did turn right. I said, yeah, right into the ditch. <laughs> so that was a good one. And, and we, and you know, to go a little bit further, we go on up the hill, um, shoot the stage <laughs> And kind of the way the stage was set up, anyone that was there will remember, there was a three-gun nation barricade, like at the bottom of the hill-ish, sort of. So we had to start at the top. I believe we ran pistol on cardboard down through there, slipping and sliding. And then uh, you had to ground your pistol, grab your rifle, and pretty much go prone in a river. Yeah. It was awesome. Oh, nice. I have There's pictures on my Facebook page from it. Uh, <laughs> we were totally covered with mud. It was a good time. Sounds like a good time. It was it was fun. That was a classic. <laughs> like, I took the video, you know, and then I get it posted up to Facebook as soon as I can. And by the time we actually get back to the lodge, like when me and Mo pull in, everybody starts talking about the Arlie and Mo show. <laughs> Everywhere you guys go, stuff always happens. And then one of you videos it and puts it on social media. And people were talking about it. And Mo's like, you videoed that? And I was like, yeah, I videoed that. <laughs> I put it on Facebook. Of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. I wasn't going to miss that. <laughs> Heck no, that was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a good time. Well, Arlie, where do you see the uh, sport of three gun uh, three gun headed? Ah, uh, to the sky. Yeah, I I love three gun. Um, I try to get everyone I know involved in three gun in some way, you know, one way or the other. Um, I just wanted to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Uh, I would like to see you know, say maybe four matches within an hour's drive of my house. So once it gets to that point to where there's four different matches within an hour's drive and I can drive there and shoot four matches from four different match directors with four different ideas, then I'll be happy. All right. Until well, then, if you're in Ohio, make that happen. Build a range. Yep. Start a three-gun match. Invite Arlie. Invite me. <laughs> I will bring my friends. If you build it, we will come. <laughs> so, Arlie, I know that you're uh, you're on Instagram. It's uh, Arlie underscore Branham. Is that right? Yes. Arlie underscore Branham. Uh, Facebook, do you do Facebook? Yep, Arlie Branham. Arlie Branham on Facebook. All yep. right, so um, I'll have links to those in the uh, in the show notes as well. If uh, you Twitter. don't know how to spell Arlie or Branham. Oh, you're a Twitter person. I'm on Twitter. He's it's on Twitter. super easy because my Instagram, I can post on Instagram. That's all I do too. And I can share it to Facebook. That's all I do too is just and share Twitter Instagram to and Twitter. And Tumblr, which Tumblr kind of just doesn't really do anything, but it is what it is. <laughs> I have a funny Tumblr story off the air. I'll off the air. That. Here we go. So, Arlie, <clears throat> well, final question here. If you can leave the audience with just one thought or one piece of advice, what would it be? Shoot fast and don't miss. Shoot fast and don't miss. That's 
It's good advice. It's really good advice. No, honestly, um, that is good advice. But don't underestimate your mental game. Because it took me three and a half years of shooting three gun um, before I realized that the mental game is possibly the most important part for me personally. So shoot fast, don't miss, don't underestimate your mental game. Awesome. Those are great uh, parting thoughts. Arlie, this has been awesome, man. I really enjoyed uh, uh, having you on the podcast here. And, uh, you know, thanks again for having me in your home. And thanks for being on the Three Gun Show. Thank you, Dave. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Arlie Branham. You know, I really liked how Arlie said that you just can't work the uh, the, the mental game too much and uh, and not to underestimate it. It is a common thread amongst all these interviews is to get your, your mental game in check. And if you don't have it in check, check out those uh, books that uh, Arlie was talking about and uh, make sure you uh, you work on it. Selected links from this episode can be found at 3gunshow.com slash episode 81. Now, the winner of the June giveaway of an MGM Targets 10-inch Sportsman's Target is Janice Kreider. Janice, congratulations. I will be uh, get, shooting you an email to get your information and send it on to MGM. And uh, if you didn't win last month, don't forget to sign up for this month's uh, giveaway of an MGM Switch View lever. You can do that at 3gunshow.com slash MGM. And when you make a purchase at MGM Targets, you can save 10% using the code DHMGM10. You can also support the 3-Gun Show podcast by using our affiliate link when you shop at Brownells. Just go to 3gunshow.com slash Brownells and shop like normal. We earn a small commission on what you buy at no additional cost to you, and uh, it helps pay for the cost of the show. If you like the show, please tell a friend, subscribe in iTunes, and leave a review. You can do that by going to 3gunshow.com slash iTunes. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, and I'll catch you in the next episode. If you are finished, unload show clear.